Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here today to introduce the SGS webinar for cybersecurity challenges in medical devices, navigating the latest updates. My name is Gregory Jacobson. I'm the sales director for the SGS North America Medical Division. Your speakers today are Willie Fabritas and Balaj Bosik. Willie is our global head of strategy for information security, and Balaj is our technical director uh, for MDD and MDR. First, a little bit about SGS. SGS is the world's leading inspection, verification, testing, and certification company. We have over 98,000 employees in over 2,650 locations around the world and expertise across seven global industry sectors. We provide assistance and expertise with global support and services that cater to all industries. We are the largest provider of audits certification training, and advisory services. We have the ability to turn your needs into comprehensive solutions with a consistent service delivery via our worldwide network and global footprint. We have highly experienced quality and regulatory experts in the medical device certification area, ready to offer training to you from our SGS Academy. At the end of this presentation, we'll have several links to you for the SGS Academy. An email will be sent later with a link to this recording and a copy of the presentation. There will be Q&A at the end, so please put all your questions in the chat box so we can discuss them at the end of the presentation. There will be a survey on your screen. Please fill it out at the end. Thank you for joining us today. To start, I'll turn it over to Balash. Thanks, Greg, and welcome, everyone. Today, um, today's presentation is actually going to build on a previous webinar in uh, September of 2022, we already started um, to provide updates uh, in the world of cybersecurity on the latest regulatory updates. Uh, so we don't plan to repeat everything that was said uh, back then. Uh, I'm, I'm going to highlight the changes, but for those of you who have missed out on that previous opportunity, that um, presentation was recorded and we will have the link to that one so you can go back and have a primer uh, for that. So today we are only going to focus on some changes, uh, some case studies, and then later we are going to talk about uh, what you can do uh, to be better prepared for uh, the cybersecurity requirements and maybe also how SGS can assist you with this preparation. So uh, we're going to talk about the growing need for cybersecurity. Um, a special type of devices uh, are um, internet-enabled devices, IoT or IOMT in this case. In the, um, um, we are going to talk about how they, um, what are their special vulnerabilities and what we can do to uh, uh, fill those holes. Then I'm going to go through a couple of case studies just to um, highlight and illustrate that this is a very real threat. Um, as I said, we are going to give a little bit of update on cybersecurity preparedness regulations uh, and what has changed since our last webinar on this topic. And then I'm going to hand it over to Billy Fabricius, who's going to talk about our ISMS uh, framework and how uh, SGS can help you with the related services. So just like we have um, seen uh, all around us, uh, the the amount of data that is being shared is constantly accelerating more and more bandwidth is available for manufacturers uh, to share they don't have to be so considerate and so um, uh, disciplined about the data that they are sending over so in some cases convenience of not having uh, data segmented into different packets or different uh, channels sometimes manufacturers these days are oversharing information over the internet and that uh, can cause additional vulnerabilities. Um, and just simply um, scanning and vetting out the information that go uh, that is being transmitted between parties is uh, is basically more and more um, problematic. Also, the computational bandwidth, of course, is is increasing, and uh, it's getting easier and easier to crack passwords. Um, 
and also to um, apply other type of vulnerabilities. So the computing power goes up. Uh, some of you may have heard about uh, quantum computers, which even promised the um, complete uh, obsolescence of a password-based uh, uh, based word because they will be uh, cracked almost instantaneously. <laughs> then we have um, the uh, Internet of Things or Internet of Medical Things. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about those. And, and around these devices, we have a concept of cloud or edge computing. Um, so in some cases, uh, the manufacturers have a different kind of control. I wouldn't say less control or more control, but they have a different type of control uh, about some of the internet traffic and some of the uh, computation uh, being performed not on their own hardware that they directly control, but on hardware that is hosted somewhere else, uh, uh, maybe also collaborating with the security policies of, um, of a, a cloud computing provider. So these all um, bring new challenges with them. Also, um, as, um, as we are all working in the healthcare industry, um, it just uh, happens to be uh, amongst uh, the top three, at least in uh, North American industries, uh, to be targeted by cyber criminals. It's closely related to the, to the or following the, the finance field and uh, some other high security um, industries. High profile healthcare data breaches are growing in frequency and scale. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of those in uh, the case studies, but definitely this is a trend that we see that, uh, you know, despite all these measures and countermeasures, and better preparedness, um, the, these breaches are still happening and are happening in more, more and more frequency and in, um, in higher and higher volume. And that is a problem because, of course, it, it uh, generates the appetite for the wrongdoers uh, to seek this as a revenue uh, for themselves. So this is not going to stop anytime soon, as far as we can see from here. Cybersecurity dominates the IT agenda across the industry. So while other technologies within IT are kind of becoming um, standardized and, and uh, become more of a steady state and we have uh, you know, ready solutions for all different kinds of uh, IT infrastructures and the hardware and software needs for different solutions, um, the cybersecurity within the whole IT palette is one that is constantly emerging, I would say, alongside with, with AI. But uh, these two topics are really dominating uh, the IT landscape. And of course, uh, both have their, their opportunities and have their own uh, risks. But for sure, cybersecurity is one of those things that can really, uh, that require a lot of preparation and can, and the lack of uh, proper uh, cybersecurity measures can expose your company to critical uh, breaches. And one other thing that is often misunderstood uh, by many manufacturers, medical device manufacturers, at least as we can see, is that uh, there's a misconception that cybersecurity requirements only apply to those manufacturers who have software in their products. But it is not true. Uh, cybersecurity requirements, at least some cybersecurity requirements, also apply to the manufacturer as an organization, because uh, some manufacturers uh, or actually I would say most of the medical device manufacturers uh, through one, one or more of their processes have to utilize or, or get in contact with a patient health information. And it is their obligation to keep this patient health, uh, health information safe. Uh, and so even if your device is non-active, say you have an implant or uh, needles and syringes uh, with, without any software, uh, you still have to, uh, keep your company and your organization um, in a safe and secure state uh, against uh, cyber attacks. So this requirement applies equally to non-active uh, device manufacturers uh, or, or device manufacturers who don't have any software in their product. Another um, aspect, and, and we should really talk about patient health information, I already mentioned that. Um, so in the connection with uh, IOMT networks, we uh, are collecting and transmitting and processing a bunch of uh, PHI information, uh, which is uh, limited uh, or there's no direction from uh, patients or health practitioners. 
uh, and it is also sometimes misunderstood by the manufacturers that um, to what degree they are responsible for this. And, and at this point, I would really just like to point out that according to ISO 13485, which is a mandatory uh, or, or basically the accepted quality management standard for medical device manufacturers, in order to claim compliance with that one, uh, clause 7.5.10 under customer property talks about safekeeping uh, of uh, customer property. And uh, the standard itself is not very explicit that patient health information is considered um, is considered customer property, but the guideline that ISO has published for the ISO 13485 clearly spells out that uh, PHI is customer property. So there are some manufacturers who say that they that they want to claim non-compliance or non-applicability for this clause because their devices they say that they don't take any customer information because you know their devices do not require servicing for example and all of the intellectual property is generated by their own without any input from the client or any other type of arguments um, sometimes they forget that they still have to handle uh, patient health information and therefore uh, the customer uh, property clause of ISO 13485 still applies. I already mentioned that the Internet of Medical Things is an emerging field. Uh, so we are talking about devices that are not maybe full-blown computers with a full user interface, but they do things um, that collect or process uh, some information in the context of a healthcare environment. Uh, some of this is patient health information, as we already discussed. Uh, so these require, and, and there's a large volume of these devices, and uh, sometimes no proper care is taken by the manufacturers because of the simplicity of these devices or because of the simple user interface. Uh, sometimes not, not the same level of care is um, taken to ensure the safety and security of these devices as uh, maybe other full-fledged uh, devices that are connected to certain networks. So it is important to point out that because of the digital transportation, there is a widespread adoption of these devices uh, on the market, and, and it's already on the market now, so it's not, not future tense. Uh, they are great for efficiency in patient care, but an easier entry point, as I already mentioned. IOMT devices transmit and capture data through uh, any wireless technology, so it can be Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or they can have different other types of radios. Um, also, of course, this is just wireless, but, but if your uh, IOM, IoT or IOMT device has um, any uh, data ports, for example, a USB port or something like that, even just for service purposes, that can be an attack vector for, uh, for cyber criminals. And uh, of course, just to illustrate how widespread these devices are, they're really everywhere. So we can look at implantable devices, pacemakers, insulin pumps. Uh, they can be different diagnostic equipment, MRI machines, blood glucose monitors, uh, standalone software, even DICOM and PAX software. Um, we can have uh, therapeutic devices like ventilators and infusion pumps or wearable uh, devices like smartwatches. So you can imagine that all of these might uh, have different levels of, um, of cyber threat, different uh, ways to attack them. Some of them have uh, even proprietary uh, software that runs on them. Some of them run a very standard um, runs a very standard operating system, for example. So for each manufacturer, it is a kind of a custom job to come up with the cyber security measures for these types of devices. But overall, uh, all the, the requirements apply to IO, IOMT devices as well. And another consideration that sometimes manufacturers, despite their best effort, um, tend to overlook is that sometimes it's not their own uh, or, or it's not enough if you just protect your own organization and the internal structures and, and you may have the best possible set up firewalls and the best possible um, cybersecurity measures. Uh, but it, it may not mean much if your supply chain is vulnerable. And so I gave a couple of examples where the legal manufacturer shall consider cyber threats outside of their company, for example, at their suppliers. Um, and by suppliers, we mean both upstream and downstream suppliers. For example, your distributor, uh, like for example, if you have a distributor in Europe, 
they may be um, uh, attacked and that because if you provide certain type of information that that is needed for them to carry out their business that may lead back to you as a legal manufacturer so you should also make sure that all of your suppliers uh, have the same level of rigor as you have in-house uh, you can have purchased parts with firmware on them i don't know how many of you remember or, or have heard back in the days one of the hard drive manufacturers had a huge scandal because um in the controller chip of the hard drive um, some malicious actors installed or manufactured in the mal malware into the control chip of the hard drive so this was very very nefarious because even after reformatting and uh, reinstalling the operating system or this system contained the malware in it and most of the virus scanners for example at the time didn't even look for any malware they didn't have even have visibility of the control chip of the of the hard drive so it completely evaded all um all detection for a very very long time so uh, this is just to point out that sometimes you can uh, purchase something where you uh, think that you purchase one thing but uh, maybe it is already infected by malware and so make sure that uh, you control this uh, all the way down through your uh, supply chain you can also have some outsource processes uh, where that can be an attack vector uh, for example if you if your devices require a field installation or field service um, and you maybe have a network of uh, technicians, field technicians who do the installation for you or who do the servicing for you. You have to make sure that they apply the same level of rigor as again you do in-house. We have seen in the past where, um, where the uh, password to put medical devices into service mode was in the installation manual, which was then left at the hospital. And so basically anybody from the hospital or whoever got their hands on the service manual could put the device on uh, into service mode. And then they accessed you know, way more functionally th than it was intended. Um, I've seen some manufacturers who have uh, then later applied uh, some special dongles that they only handed out physically to uh, to those people who need to do installation on service of these devices uh, so that uh, that the presence of that dongle was needed. So there are measures that can be taken to reinforce um, the security of these devices. But for sure, please don't, uh, you know, put out your passwords, for example, uh, or um, and, and ensure that these uh, technicians or engineers that go to the field will undergo the same level of training as the in-house personnel that you have. Also, maybe it's related to one of the, the previous items that I already mentioned, but you can have uh, software of unknown provenance uh, incorporated in the products and you don't necessarily con uh, control um, the cybersecurity preparedness of that piece of code or library or whatever you're incorporating into your software. And that can already have vulnerabilities in itself. Of course, you can test the whole system, but sometimes it is a better idea to make sure that the, that the soup is already secure or is up to snuff with, with regards to security um, already in its original form before you incorporate it in, in your system, because um, the more complex the system is, the less you are able to fully test it out and test all the vulnerabilities. So it's, it's uh, usually more practical to test them in smaller chunks if you have the opportunity. And then uh, I already mentioned some flavor of this topic, but uh, the use environment can also be an attack, attack vector. So, um, you know, you can, because your device can only do so much if some other devices um, have a potential uh, or, or are the weak links and the whole hospital IT network is being attacked through someone else's devices that are hooked on the same network as yours. Um, and then through that, maybe they, once, the, once the attackers are already in, they might get uh, expose your device to additional vulnerabilities that, that you never encountered on its own. Um, only when you hook it up to a hospital IT network. So there are standards uh, of how to do the risk management and the risk mitigation um, in a hospital IT network. I think in the last uh, webinar we talked about that, so I would highly recommend that you uh, go and watch that. And a couple of case studies. So <clears throat> a 
uh, here are just two, two maybe bigger examples of medical device recalls because of cybersecurity. Uh, so one was a longer one, actually it was from uh, 2018 to 2021. It was a class one recall, uh, over 30,000 remote controlled insulin pumps were recalled, but there was a potential for unauthorized access due to lack of security controls. Hackers could record and replay communication between remote and pump. So that means that they can, from that point on, they can spoof any such communication uh, with some other uh, device as well. They had the ability to alter insulin dosage or halt delivery, which is like a direct th uh, threat to uh, human health. It also had the potential for serious health implications or death. And the remediation was a field replacement of devices, uh, and the manufacturer obviously had to incur all the recall costs, uh, including shipping of new devices, uh, RMA, shipping back the, uh, the defective devices. Uh, so it was a huge deal, huge financial loss for the manufacturer. In April 2023, there was a class two recall. Uh, over a thousand sequencers, these are IVD sequencers, uh, had to be recalled uh, because there was a potential for unauthorized access due to lack of security controls. Hackers could take control remotely and alter configurations and genomic data. And uh, the faulty results uh, or a full data breach was possible. Um, and uh, the remediation was a software patch. Obviously, you can see that this one is a maybe a smaller magnitude or a smaller uh, severity. Also, the class is different. It's a lower class recall. But nevertheless, um, still, it is a financial loss uh, for, the, uh, for the manufacturer. So that's why it is super important to try to uh, curtail this as much as possible and only release products when they are meeting the current cybersecurity needs and later keep them up to date proactively, not just when something happens, but proactively keep the, the devices uh, up to date with the safety and security standards. Um, another, maybe even more scary uh, thing, and again, maybe as medical device manufacturers, we may say that, you know, that's not our primary concern, but uh, if your device is the one through which they have uh, breached the hospital network, then of course it might be, a, might be your problem as well. Uh, at least, you know, if it, if it comes down to that, I can imagine that healthcare providers are going to frown upon your, your brand from that point on, and they may even drop you as a supplier. So a couple of cases, July 2023, 11 million patients um, PHI has been uh, exposed. It was an unauthorized access from a laptop at an external location. There were, it resulted in four class action lawsuits. Another case was February and March of 2023. 8.8 .8 million patients' uh, data was exposed. It was a malware and ransomware attack, and service provider refused to pay the $10 million ransom. And so the patient health information, including those of children, was sold to the dark web, which is not good. Uh, let's just put it that way. Um, end of 2022, beginning of 23. 3 million patients, uh, there was a malware via phishing email, uh, there were 11 lawsuits, um, basically these were also class action lawsuits. In another case, it was a slightly different flavor, but at the end of 2022, 4,000 patients um, suffered because there was an access through a third party technology partner um, and radiology and ultrasound apps were rendered inaccessible plus uh, some previous data was lost and the uh, backup was only partially successful. And so for a period of time, 2022 April through December, some electronic records were permanently lost. So again, very bad. If you have like a, a treatment history or you are preparing for oncology, you know, radiology or ultrasound uh, tests and, and your results are gone, that is bad news. Uh, that, that can seriously slow down the treatment planning so, um, so uh, obviously, this might be a smaller uh, magnitude, but I can imagine that these things also happen more frequently than, than the full-on uh, data breaches. So, just these four cases, and by no means is this the full palette of, of, uh, of cases that have happened or breaches in the healthcare industry, um, but already these four cases exposed 6% of the total U.S. populations patient health information in just a span of eight months. So this might highlight the extent of the problem that, that a large portion of the US 
population because of course everyone has some doctors visits every now and then so uh, cyber security is everyone's business because no none of us like we do all these extreme measures of protecting our you know privacy and private information uh, but at the same time, through our healthcare providers, who would be one of the most trusted uh, service providers in our private life, uh, these data breaches are so prevalent and so extensive that uh, like millions of people are getting their, their uh, data being sold to the dark web or just being exposed to uh, who knows what other uh, external parties. And then you can like this can lead to other stuff like you can have you know identity uh, theft and and a bunch of other um, negative consequences doxing uh, who knows beyond that we don't have any control. So um, this is a little bit of a um, maybe just a highlight of how globally. Um, data privacy and cybersecurity is already being regulated. And this is not the full picture, it's just some of the major territories and major jurisdictions. Uh, just to highlight that we uh, have different, uh, again, data privacy and cybersecurity preparedness requirements. Um, we have a white paper published, and we can also give you the link to that one which will give you the full list and, and that will also cover the updates uh, since our previous one because it, it also has the dates of when these different uh, changes happened and, and when certain things came to effect. Um, so I just want to highlight a couple of items here. So in Canada, we have a regulation, US, Brazil, EU, Russia, India, China, Japan, Australia, you can see that all of these uh, countries have either one or the other uh, regulations, meaning cybersecurity and data privacy regulations in place. Like basically all uh, advanced uh, or, or uh, developing uh, societies take this into account. I didn't put it in, the, in uh, this uh, simplified um, chart because it would have made it maybe too crowded, but also there's a bunch of African countries like South Africa, Nigeria, and, and a couple of other countries who are also following suit. So uh, this is not just, um, not just for the developed countries, it is, it is really applicable to the whole world. And some of these other things uh, also have requirements like in the, in the orange ones, you see um, uh, the ones that are more focusing on the cybersecurity side of things. So in Europe, uh, we still have the MDCG 2019-16. Uh, for It's a guidance on cybersecurity for medical devices. In Canada, we have a pre-market requirements for medical device cybersecurity. In the US, we have a couple of um, FDA uh, guidelines uh, for both uh, pre- and post-market uh, life cycle stage. For Brazil, they have... Um, came out with the resolution for the regulation of uh, software as a medical device, which has some cybersecurity considerations. Um, and this is not only just for new devices. The IMDRF came up with principles and practices for the cybersecurity of legacy medical devices. So if, if your devices have been designed and released before these requirements uh, became effective, then uh, maybe it is a good idea to go back, download this guideline. You will have the link uh, in the presentation that you will get, and you can download this, uh, this guideline, and you can see how you can um, uh, reconcile your legacy devices to, um, or at least to assess if you can keep those legacy devices on the market, and if you can, what are the activities that you have to do to reinforce them uh, to be up to date in their uh, cybersecurity measures. And I think with that, I would like to turn it over to Billy Fabricius to talk about what we can do uh, together. Thank you, Balas. Much appreciated. That was a very, very good overview. And I uh, think this was very, very valuable. Um, but be before I start my session, uh, Balas, there is a question from a member of the audience referring to, I believe, slide 10. What is soup? 
Yes, I mentioned uh, along the way, I didn't write it out on the slide, but Soup is software of unknown provenance. Basically, it's software that someone else has control over, where you don't even necessarily have control over the or visibility in the source code. So that is basically software that someone else did, and you don't, you cannot be sure in this context about the cybersecurity of that piece of code. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is... Um... That leads a little bit into the, the S-BOM, the software bill of material, right? In terms of organizations really need to know what kind of components they have within their device. And the hardware, everybody has a BOM, has a bill of material. But how many manufacturers actually do have a clear overview of the software components they have in their stack? And when I go back to my auditing days, uh, the answer was not that many. That said, uh, when we look back at uh, the first half of the presentation, it seems to be quite overwhelming and complex, especially when we look at the world's map with the regulations. People may say, people say, OMG, how do I manage that? And that's a serious concern because at the end of the day, the day has only 24 hours. So somehow we need to have a mechanism in place that allows us to manage this relatively complex environment. And it's not just the technology, it's the legal requirements from the privacy perspective and from you know, the GDPR and the EU Cybersecurity Act and the upcoming EU AI Act, uh, and so on and so forth. So how, how do we manage that? And the answer is actually surprisingly simple. We need to have a governance framework. We need to have a government's governance system that allows us to not just implement, but also maintain and even further to improve the system. Many people refer to that governance framework as a management system. And I think everyone on the call knows the management system that is called quality management system. And that's very good because that's already setting the tone. That's the foundation, so to speak, right? But we would like to emphasize that there is also a management system for information security. And now you may say, just hold on. We were talking about cybersecurity and breaches. Now there's a new term, information security. What is that? Well, from an ISO perspective, information security is the umbrella term that includes, among others, cybersecurity. For example, we are exchanging information right now. We could do that at a restaurant, we could do that on the plane, we could do that at a bar. There would be no internet connectivity necessary to exchange this information. So how do we protect that? How do we protect the information we are responsible for from unauthorized access independent of network connectivity? That is the wider term that should be used in terms of information security. So cybersecurity is just a subdomain of information security. And information security is really based on the concept of the CIA triad. And CIA does not stand for Culinary Institute of Americas, nor for a three-letter acronym government agency. But CIA really stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So confidentiality is addressing the question of, can I have access, should I have access to that particular set of information? Availability, the question would be, is the information available if and when I need it? And integrity addresses the question of, is the data I get actually correct? So let's make an example. If you ask me, Willie, how much do you have in your checking account? 
Well, I say, well, honestly, none of your business. It's a question of confidentiality. Done, right? So now let's say I go to an ATM and I would like to know how much I do have in my checking account and the ATM doesn't work. Hmm. No problem. I just simply go to another ATM and check there. Hmm. Not working. Third one, not working. Now I'm getting really nervous as in what's going on? The information I need, the information I should have access to is not available. And then on the other hand, I think I just got my salary and I check whether I got my salary and my checking account says minus $2. Oops. Is this really true? I mean, I just got my salary minus two. Uh, what, what, what happened? Now I get nervous because my first thought would be unauthorized access to my account. But it's quite possible that the information I get is just simply blatantly wrong. So all those three components, the integrity of the information, the confidentiality of the information, and the availability of the information are crucial and need to be protected. And the management system I'm proposing for information security is based on the ISO 27001, which is now in the third or fourth revision. It has been updated many times now to, to address um, changes in, in, envi in the environment. But ISO 27001, we also see as an umbrella that really helps an organization to manage their obligations with regard to uh, CMMC or ITIL or SOC2 or GDPR, uh, HIPAA or whatever information security governance framework they need to oblige to, ISO 27001 helps to manage that. Fundamentally, the structure is very similar to what the audience may know from ISO 9001. And that is by design, because all those management system standards for quality, for environmental management, for information security, are based upon what is called the high-level structure of ISO. And it's a mandatory requirement from ISO to ISO standards that says that the structure of a management system shall follow the following structure. And that's being spelled out in the high-level structure. Uh, by the way, for, for those who are interested in you know, looking a little bit into the future, uh, the high-level structure has changed and coming forward, all future um, updated ISO management system standards will include a clause that requires the organization to consider the impact of their management system to the environment. Uh, it's not right now in the standards, but will come. And it's my understanding from a committee perspective that the very first standard that will update it will be the ISO 14001. Uh, subsequently, uh, 9000 and all the other management system standards will follow suit. So the, the general structure of ISO 27001 is talking about the context of the organization. And that is very, very important because on a regular basis, from, from my auditing time, I can tell you organizations don't really specify their context in which they operate. Organizations need to know who, who are our customers, who are our suppliers, who are our business partners, in order to really manage that relationship correctly. Uh, Balas mentioned earlier the example of a European-based distributor. Well, does the organization know who they are? Do they know where they are located? Do they know what kind of infrastructure they have? Does the organization have visibility of potential hacks of those distributors, that needs to be documented and needs to be understood. Following with leadership and planning and support and operation and performance and improvement, all those things are very much the same as in any other management system standard. But 27001 has a very interesting component and this is called risk assessment. And in the risk assessment, the organization needs to identify potential risks and the impact of those risks, and then identify suitable controls. So using Balassa's example earlier with the service port on the device, if, if that device has 
I don't know, let's say a USB port for service purposes, the question would be, does this port constitute any risk? And if the answer is no, that would be a non-conformance. Uh, the answer should be yes, it constitutes a risk, and the risk could be unauthorized access, um, it could be, um, I don't know, other uh, bad activities being done via this port. And then the question would be, what are we doing about that? What are the countermeasures? And once we have established those uh, risks and the countermeasures, we define those and record those in what is called the statement of applicability. Once we have done that, we need to compare our list of controls with the list of the controls in the Annex A of the standard. And most likely, there will be differences. And if so, that's fine. But that is a crucial step because it's a requirement of the 27001 that an organization identifies their, their controls and compares their controls with the controls identified in the Annex A. And if any controls from the Annex A of the standard are not applicable, that's OK. But that must be not just documented, but also justified. So just saying software development, we don't do that, doesn't really count. There needs to be a reason. There needs to be, for example, due to the fact that we are buying off-the-shelf items and we are not developing any software, that clause of the standard is not applicable. OK, that, that makes no sense. And that needs to be documented. Um, so we mentioned earlier already uh, a white paper as well as previous webinars. Uh, please have a look at those at the, at the white paper as well as the webinar. Um, usually there is the question, are you guys going to share the presentation with us? Yes, we are. So please have a look at the uh, upcoming email and feel free to then download um, or watch the previous webinar and download the white paper. Um, and then um, a couple of questions that we hear on a regular basis in terms of, so what are the business and financial benefits of certification? Um, one of the most important statements we always hear is repeatability. Once a process is documented and implemented, it can be repeated. And that's very crucial when it comes, for example, to incidences, when it comes to breaches. The last thing you want to have is a situation where you say, um, OK, who should we now contact? No, that needs to be documented. Um, or you should say, hmm, uh, we, we believe we have a breach. Uh, should we contact the authorities? Uh, well, that should be not really a question. That should be already laid out in the applicable incident management process. Or you hear about a vulnerability and you say, hmm, wondering if we could potentially patch. No, that should be already documented. And this is the benefit of established documented procedures because they are repeatable and therefore can be executed if and when needed. So it really educates and prepares employees. But there is, because it's now operationalized is also the benefit of enhanced efficiency in the operations. And, and let's, let's be brutally honest. Um, if, if you have 10 people doing pretty much the same, but not really the same, you have differences. And that's bad. Because at the end of the day, if something goes wrong, you don't know where it went wrong. But if you have 10 people doing exactly the same, following exactly the same procedure, and something goes wrong, then you can highlight that, identify it, you fix the procedure, and going forward, it will be hopefully better. And let's face it, there will be situations that are not exactly nice, that are bad. And then the question would be, obviously, how do we address that with regard to business continuity and the protection of our external reputation? And it's nothing worse to say, I don't know. No. You need to have a process in place to be able to sustain a disruption and allow the organization to be resilient. Uh, obviously, um, certification provides also 
external trust because at the end of the day, a third party like SGS puts their name on it and says, yes, we have verified that company XYZ has indeed an effective management system and that's being documented by a certificate. And, you know, a certificate in itself um, has has a, a, already some value. You know, it's, it's an it's an additional value to the company, whether this is adding 10% of value or whether this is doubling the company's value, that's a totally different story. But this intangible asset is really something that an organization needs to account for. It's like a patent. It's like a recipe for um, the secret sauce. An asset has value and a certification is an asset. And this is how we need to see it. Um, and Companies that are certified, they are not immune from being hacked, but the impact will be significantly lower. And that's the important thing. And therefore, um, a certification helps the organization also to avoid major financial losses. Last but not least, um, reduce compliance costs. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, regulators as well as uh, certification bodies and, and notified bodies do understand the benefits of certification. So therefore, by definition, if you have already everything documented, everything is ready, uh, available to, to be provided to, to the authorities and auditors, that in itself reduces the cost because it's much, much faster and easier. So then on the next slide, um, this is the, let's say, typical uh, certification process. Uh, many in the audience may have seen already from the past. Uh, it all starts with an application and subsequent quote from us, from SGS. Um, and on a regular basis, something like just alone, there needs to be an application. Uh, yes, because at the end of the day, we need to make sure that the organization is eligible for certification. And frankly speaking, and maybe that's most important, that we are able and capable to deliver the certification to this particular company. So there needs to be an application and subsequent quote, followed by ensuring that your people are competent. Uh, and, and that may sound like, come on, are you telling me we are not competent? Well, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the organization needs to make sure that people involved in the certification process are knowledgeable of the requirements of the applicable standard, in this case, 27001, and that's not just having a copy of the standard. That really means having understood what the intention, the intent, and the requirements of the standard are. And this is best achieved by going to a, to a course and learn about uh, that these requirements from an instructor. Then there is the, what we call the, the gap assessment. A gap assessment is not a requirement um, of the certification process, I must emphasize that. However, the gap assessment is highly um, suggested, um, super, super beneficial, because at the end of the day, it's kind of a dry run before the stage one and stage two, I will come to that later, so that the organization and most importantly, the employees really understand what is being expected from them during the stage one, stage two audit. So I mentioned already stage one, the stage one is about confirmation that the implemented uh, that the implementation of the management system is is on the right track. Um, it mainly makes sure that the documentation is up to snuff and fulfills the requirements. And I must admit, you know, in 20 years ago or something like that, the stage one was done on the plane between two audits. Um, but um, that's not going to fly any longer. Because at the end of the day, it's a formal assessment, needs to be done on-prem, needs to be done uh, at the client side to really understand what the client is doing and whether the documentation available actually matches what, what the organization is doing. And then there's the big bang audit, as I call it, the stage two. And this is really about uh, the confirmation that the management system is fully, fully implemented. And that's usually a couple of days long, uh, maybe even two auditors or three auditors um, but this is the, the most intense and time consuming audit uh, the organization has because subsequently in, in the following years when we are in the surveillance audit mode, 
uh, the time is obviously not as much as for the stage two. Uh, and the recertification after three years is uh, also not that much. Um, rule of thumb is surveillance audit is about one third of the time necessary for the stage one, stage two combined. The recertification audit is about two thirds of the uh, time necessary for the stage one, stage two combined. And then finally, um, after successful um, audit of the state and finishing the stage two audit, the organization is hopefully and most likely awarded the certification. Um, yes, there are situations where the organization is not ready. And yes, there are situations where the certification process has been abandoned. Uh, but with the literally thousands of audits I have done in, in the last 25 or so years, there may have been 10 or so. So yes, it's possible, but very unlikely. <clears throat> but most importantly, I think, is, is the last step. And this is the ongoing improvement. And I think this is a huge, huge difference between, let's say, the black and white regulatory requirement versus the management system environment. In the regulatory environment is, do you fulfill? Yes, no. Totally binary, right? In a management system environment, there is, OK, there's a requirement. You fulfill that. However, I must admit, it's really not good. But that's OK. Because next year, I'm coming back and verify, and you better improve that. Because there is a requirement in the standard that says the organization shall continuously improve the information security management system. And that really helps over time to go from you know here to there. And, and I vividly remember um, a couple of years back, maybe, maybe 10, 15 years back, a client told me on the way you know, from the office to the rental car, something along the line, Willie, you know, um, last management review meeting was really not nice because we needed to explain to our executive or executives why we were so bad three years ago. It was something like, uh, instead of celebrating the improvement, they were questioning how bad, why we were that bad three years ago. Who cares, right? But this is for me, the example of the power of an effective management system that helps the organization to continuously improve. So here are a couple of uh, certificates um, you may have seen um, uh, from issued by SGS. And as mentioned, um, ISO 27001 has changed a couple of times. So um, the latest edition is from uh, 2022. Um, and uh, currently, we are in the transition from 27001 to um, 2013 to the 22 edition of the standard. So that's the reason why we have the um, old certificate and a new certificate as a template. But these are the typical certificates we are issuing. Um, and uh, that, no, I think I jumped over one slide. No, I didn't. Let's see. Um, and then I would like to um, point out that we have uh, in our SGS Training Academy, uh, a list of wonderful courses that might be of uh, benefit for the audience, whether this is specific for the MDR implementation or whether this is specific for ISO 27001, that's a different story. But please go to the website, uh, click on the links um, in, in the presentation if you are interested in any of those classes. That said, um, Subscribe for more information um, via uh, the link. Go to our YouTube channel. Um, follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, scan this uh, QR code so that we are able to provide you with further information. And that brings me to the end of this webinar. So thank you very, very much for your time. I sincerely hope that you uh, learned something. And if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. Respectively, feel free to um, email us um, at the email addresses uh, pointed out. So let me see if we have any questions. I think we opened this uh, clarified soup, what this is. Do we have any other questions for the audience?
Greg, do you see any questions? <clears throat> hey, Willie, it's Greg. Um, I don't. Um, no, don't see any other questions. I guess well, we can uh, close it out. Well, there's normally that, that question, how long and how much? Oh, um, here's, here we go. So how, how long does it take and how much does it cost? Um, well, <laughs> that, that really depends upon the situation. That really depends upon the circumstances of an organization. And I think it's pretty easy to understand that, let's say, a five-person, one-location company uh, requires less effort than a multi-billion dollar company that is having offices around the globe. So when we are talking about certification costs for 27,001 in this particular case, it really, really depends. And I would like to encourage the audience to reach out with uh, specific questions. Uh, but then there is also questions concerning the MD. Uh, and I think, Balas, you might be able to answer that, but I'm not sure. Yes, for sure. Um, while we are looking at that one, there was a question. Uh, there was actually a, a technical question from one of the one of the attendees as well. What about the new specific standards for medical devices, IEC 6601-4-5, IEC 81001-5-1, UL 2900 one what is the mandatory application date for new devices and for legacy devices? So um, we are, I mean, uh, in general, maybe we should have had this disclaimer in the beginning, but we cannot consult on specific applications of these standards. What we can say in general is that uh, the different uh, jurisdictions will have their own application rules uh, for standards. Uh, by default, the use of standards is never mandatory. Uh, however, um, that is kind of just uh, maybe a theoretical answer. In practice, the regulators and also us as your certification body or notified body are going to uh, evaluate your uh, specific solution against the requirements of these standards. And we will probably only uh, accept your uh, solution to be compliant if your um, solution is at least results in a device that is at least as uh, safe, effective, and in this case, secure, as if you had used the standard. So maybe that's just a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, now, uh, to, be, uh, to give a little bit more specific answer, the different jurisdictions will have their own rules. Uh, they will list uh, standards um, and uh, like consensus standards, or in Europe, it would be harmonized standards. And the, the expectation is that you can only claim compliance with the broader regulatory requirement if you comply with the standards or, or something that's more strict than the standard requirement. Um, and uh, basically, when, when standards are being revised, uh, these regulators are posting uh, dates uh, until which the, pre the use of the previous version of the standard can be used to still presume uh, conformity with the regulatory requirements. These tables are typically uh, out there. You can, if you don't have it, or if there's any confusion, sometimes the European Union, for example, they are a little bit behind uh, with publishing these tables. Um, so you can always just speak with your uh, EC representative if there's any questions and that they, they can consult with the competent authorities. You can ask your notify body if they know anything more specific. At least we won't be able to consult on how to comply with the standard, but maybe we can provide clarity of what is the current version of standard that we are, um, that we are performing the conformity assessment against. And um, the other... Uh, and in, in other cases, like in the US, for example, you can just literally turn to the US FDA. It's also a difference whether we are talking about new devices or legacy devices. Um, and uh, for new devices, surely um, the regulators are going to expect you uh, to use the benchmark of the current version of the standard. Um, then you are doing your 510k application or any other regulatory approval application. Uh, they, will, they will expect you to use that. If you want to use an older version because you feel, and we have seen it in the past cases, that it was um, the new versions had some errors, 
then you can uh, write a justification and just negotiate and discuss with the regulator. That's maybe the best answer I can give. Otherwise, we would need to look deeper into these particular standards. Excellent. Thank you, Balas. Um, so that said, um, it's the top of the hour. And I uh, once again would like to uh, thank the audience for your time. And I hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did. And see you the next time. Bye-bye. Take care.